You know, I wanted to share with you a Bible verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, actually verses 14 to 21. This is the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the church at Corinth. He said, for Christ's love compels us. Those are five key words for us to chew on tonight, those first five. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we live for Jesus. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, with, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The new, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And all this is from God. It's not from us who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We'll be talking about that tonight too, forgiveness and reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And grace and peace to you this evening from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Great readings for today. They're kind of long for tonight, aren't they? Uh, But really good stuff for us to think about tonight. Elijah, God gets him back on his feet. Elijah, Elijah, you know, has just experienced some, some miracles from God. And yet, uh, when, when Jezebel hears about that great miracle that God performed, you know, with the prophets of Baal, remember that? Uh, he had all the prophets gathered together, and he, they tried to, you know, make the, uh, make the fire pit alive, and that didn't work out. And then God prayed, or Elijah prayed to God. He came down and sucked up all the water and burned everything on the altar, and, and then all the, the prophets from Baal were killed. So Jezebel, you know, the the wicked wife of King Ahaz, one of the worst kings, wicked kings, you know, she's lost her investment. I mean, she's invested in all these priests, and and here Elijah kills them all off. And instead of turning to God and asking him for help, he's, he's afraid, okay, can I say it, of a woman. And he runs for his life. And he's bummed out and he's depressed and he sat down under a tree you know and he said I've had enough Lord Uh, take my life I'm no better than my ancestors you know than my fathers who have all died just just kill me like they've they've all died as well and then he lay under a tree and he fell asleep angel touched him he looked around there was some baked bread hot, hot coals a jar of water he he ate and drank and then he lay down again Angel of the Lord came back a second time. Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So that's what he did. Speaking of bread of life, you know, Jesus, I am the bread of life. Food for us that doesn't spoil. We are to consume Jesus. That's what we do in worship. We hear his word. We receive his sacraments. The angel of the Lord provided food so that Elijah could be strengthened. And he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And isn't that interesting? That's the same mountain, Mount Horeb, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. On a different mountain, though. But Elijah going to the same mountain, Moses received the Ten Commandments. So if you're down, if you're depressed, and you need spiritual food, and you need to be renewed, and you need to be revitalized, and and you need a little boost, well, you've come to the right place, amen? You're in church on Saturday night. You're here to receive the goods. That's why we call it the divine service. It's the divine serving us. So if we don't show up for the meal then we can't be fed, and we can't be strengthened for the journey, and we can't make it through the headaches and the difficulties of life if we're not feeding on the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians, I mean, if you're looking for a scripture reading to help you live out the Christian life, if that's what you want to do, and most Christians, you know, want to do that, they want to please God, they want to honor God, they they do really want to live a life that pleases Him, then it's all right here for us. We're to put off the old self and put on the new self, right? And that's another reason we're here too. You know, we need to be reminded that we're sinners, that we're forgiven sinners, we're absolved sinners, we're we're loved sinners in Jesus. So each morning when we get up, we do what we usually do. We say our prayers. We remember that we're a baptized child of God. We drown the old person so that the new person can come forward and live a life that is pleasing to God. And it says here that 
in our anger, we're not to sin. Any of you get angry this past week? Get upset about something? Cross the line into sin? It's okay to be angry. God's a God-given emotion. It's what you do with that anger that matters. Are you going to control the anger, or are you going to sin while you're angry? Most of us have sinned against that one many, many times. Just look at your spouse right now, (laughs) or anybody else, exactly. But thank goodness we're forgiven sinners in Jesus. Amen? And thank goodness that Jesus has taken away the anger and the wrath of God because he could condemn us to hell for all eternity. He could just wipe us out. He could just divorce us and have nothing to do with us because of our sins. You know, he's a holy and righteous God, and we aren't, and we fall short, and a holy God can't have anything to do with sinners. But God took out his anger on Jesus, his wrath on Jesus, his condemnation on Jesus, and he who had no sin became sin for us so that we could be right with God. Amen? Man, I need to be reminded of that. You too? Hey, you know, thank you, God, for giving us Jesus, and, and thank you, Jesus, for taking on the wrath of God, you know, being forsaken, completely damned. You know that cuss word that people like to use? That's exactly what a professor said happened to Jesus. You know, that's what God did. Damned him on the cross so that you and I wouldn't experience that damnation. So literally said, that's exactly what happened. And then we hear of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And, you know, once again, it's God's desire that all people believe so that they can be saved. It says, he says here in the the reading from John chapter 6, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, I don't know about you, but do you have any friends, acquaintances, people you know that don't believe? Do you? I mean... I know most of us maybe hang out with Christian people. We get that, you know, especially we work in Christian. But I got friends. I've only been in Vegas four years, you know, that, that don't believe. And I'm praying for them. I'm trying to at least to remember to do that and, and just slowly building relationships with them so that I can talk with them and have opportunities to share the reason for the hope that lives within me. And it usually starts off with my sinfulness and my brokenness and my need for a Savior. So why do we do all these things? Why do we come to the divine service? Why do we feed on the, feed on the bread of life? Why do we forgive others? Why do we want to be reconciled with people who have sinned against us? I like those first five words on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. Can we all say that together tonight? For Christ's love compels us. We're all on a journey, and we know for certain that through faith in Jesus, when we leave this planet, that we're going to be on a heavenly journey for all eternity. Amen? And that's why an elderly widow of a preacher was shocked to receive this email. A man had left the snow-filled streets of Chicago to vacation in sunny Florida. Now, this is kind of back in the day when the internet and email just came out. And his wife, a businesswoman, was scheduled to fly down and meet him there the next day. And upon arriving at the hotel, the man decided to email his wife, but he forgot the paper that her address was on. And trying to remember her email address, he missed by one letter, and an elderly widow of a preacher received his message. The widow's husband had died only a few days earlier. When she read the message, she screamed. Her grown-up children ran to see what was the problem. They noticed an email message on her computer screen. The message read, Dearest wife, just checked in and awaiting your arrival tomorrow. Eternally yours, your husband. P.S. It sure is hot down here. (laughs) Kind of hot in Vegas too, isn't it? This message is going to heat up a little bit as well. Now, I want to encourage you as people of God to continue to continue. Doing what? To forgive other people and to be reconciled as you yourselves have been forgiven and reconciled to God. And and that was actually the title of a 
a lecture that, at an urban conference that I attended, and, he, and he, the person basically said to the audience, you know, when it comes to living out the faith in Jesus Christ, when it comes to at least trying to be faithful, we're sinners and we fall short, what you need to do is you need to continue to continue. And I've just never forgotten that. Continue to continue, because some people, they don't continue. They give up. They throw in the towel. They quit coming to church, reading God's Word, the portals of prayer, hanging out with Christian friends, receiving the bread of life and Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ. They don't continue. They discontinue. Why do we continue? Why do we, as the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? I think we do it because Christ's love compels us. Let me ask you this. Did you ever see a, a copy or a print of Rembrandt's famous painting, Storm on the Sea of Galilee? The Bible reminds or records that Jesus was in the boat with his 12 disciples. He's sleeping. They're scared. According to the Bible, there were 13 men in the boat. But in Rembrandt's painting, there are 14 men, not 13. And close examination reveals that Rembrandt put himself in the boat with the 12 disciples and Jesus. And he wasn't on an ego trip. He wasn't looking for compliments. He was declaring his helplessness and hopelessness against sin and the storms of life without Christ. He was declaring in all his fame and skill, Lord, I need you above all things. The first commandment. You should fear and love God. Or you should have no other gods before me. And then it was Luther's explanation of it. We should fear and love God above all things, right? All things. All of us are still in the boat of life and we continue to be until the Lord calls us home and we never know when that's going to be. So that's why we always want to walk around with the passport of faith. Until that time, we'll continue to struggle with the storms of sins and storms of fear, storms of uncertainty and storms of failure, storms of shame, storms of guilt, storms of masks and storms of isolation, storms of loneliness and storms of depression, just like Elijah, storms of unforgiveness and bitterness, storms of disease and storms of pandemics. And sometimes we might cry to God in despair like the frightened disciples. Lord, don't you care if we drown? <laughs> and he'll hear our prayer. We've ridden on the storm-tossed sea and witnessed that God loved us so much that he commanded it to be still and the winds to be calm. Amen? We've stood beneath the cross of Jesus Christ and listened to him say about us, Father, forgive them for what no, they know not what they do. Amen? We've stood at the empty tomb and listened to the angel say, He is not here, He is risen. Amen? We've looked at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and come to Paul's conclusion that if God be for us, who can be against us? And some of us have stared death in the face and smiled and said in simple childlike faith, My grandson's got to leave because I'm, I'm ranting and wailing up here. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why you, the believers of FGS, will continue to continue to forgive others as God has forgiven you, to forgive one another, to forgive your friends, to forgive your family members, to forgive acquaintances, people who have sinned against you. Um, people all over the world need Jesus. And people all over the world need to know what forgiveness is, you know, to let go and to let God. If you don't think people need him, then think on these statistics. On any given night in America, there's 70 million insomniacs pacing the floor. As a society, we all have the technology we can use. We have it all. We have sleeping pills and herbal sleep remedies and drugs and music and earplugs and eye shades and adjustable beds and water beds, air, air beds, complete isolation tanks uh, and, and cannabis dispensaries all designed to help us sleep and find peace of mind to shut out the world and shut down our minds. But 70 million people are going to stay up tonight in America, pacing the floor, worrying over their jobs, angry about a relationship with a co-worker, wanting to control all the events of their life. Others walk the floors because they're high on cocaine or speed or, or they're trying to understand the mind of a teenager or trying to figure out how to make a month's salary last two months. They're worried about their marriages, their jobs, their children, and the virus. And some of them are wondering if God really loves them, if, if, if anybody really 
cares. I mean, it's a beautiful world out there, isn't it? There's lots of blessings for us. There's Everywhere we look, there, there's blessings and there's miracles and we see the presence of God. But it's also a world of pain and suffering because of sin, injustice and unfairness. It's a world of crime and corruption in high and low places. It's a world of disease and death. It's a world of sin and we all need Jesus. And with him, we can put our heads on a pillow and take comfort of the words of Psalm 4, verse 8. I like these words, Psalm 4, verse 8, if you can't remember that. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Doesn't that sound good? I was working out today, and uh, I've got this guy about half my age. He, he knows I'm a pastor over here, and he, he just keeps on asking me questions about our church. What a problem to have, you know? Uh, a former Catholic who keeps on telling me that he thinks he's more Lutheran than he is a Catholic. And so as we're doing, running a 400 three times today, because he's my workout partner, he's, he's asking me about the church. And I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to run, you know. I can hardly breathe, man, you know. But I'm, I'm talking with him. And then we get to the, you know, the, the weight portion. We're doing, we're doing cleans, you know. To, and, and uh, you know, and... and I'm adding a, 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 a little more weight than he is, okay, in modesty, you know. And uh, he, he looks at the owner of, of the place and says, man, man, that guy just, he can, really, he can really lift the weight. And she said to him, don't let him fool you. You know, he might be old. He might be bald. Don't let him fool you. You know, we heard in Ephesians, don't let the devil get a foothold. Don't let the devil fool you. Because that's what he wants to do to all of us. He wants to fool us. He wants to harden our heart. He wants us to be filled with bitterness and resentfulness. He wants us to be about unforgiveness. He doesn't want us to reconcile with other people. And all he wants to do is fool us into thinking that our faith in Jesus Christ, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and being led and guided by the Holy Spirit and living with joy and peace is all foolish. So I say to you what she said to him. Don't let him fool you. I was driving around on Friday. That was my day off, and uh, I was going by a church. I think I was up on West Oakey, and I think the name of the church was First Baptist Church. And they always have some interesting signs at First Baptist Church, if you can picture that on Oakey. And, and this one said, we're a Facebook church. We seek his face and read his book. Psalm 27, verse 8. I kind of like that. I had to turn around, and take a picture of it. Psalm 27, verse 8, look it up tonight. We, we seek his face, which is what the psalm is all about, and we read his book. Why do we do that? Why do we seek his face? Why do we read his book? And why do we forgive as we've been forgiven? Oh, yeah, I remember why. For the love of Christ compels us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.